Welcome to the podcast, People More Interesting Than Me. I'm your host, Michael Strumsky. This week, I spoke with the inventor of cookies, Lou Montuli. And I'm not talking about the cookies that come from elves and trees. I'm talking about the web cookies that have become a billion dollar advertising tool. However, when 23 year old Lou Montuli invented cookies at Netscape, a company that built one of the internet's first widely used browsers. He intended to revolutionize the way that users interact with the internet. Before cookies, internet sites had no memory of visits, which means there was no such thing as shopping carts or user accounts on the internet. In this episode, Lou talks about what made him become a web developer and how cookies and the numerous other advances that he helped develop at Netscape have changed over time. The overall message of this episode, getting a job that doesn't suck. Today I have with me is Lou Montuli. Did I say that right, by the way? Uh, Montuli, yes. That's that's very close. By the way, (laughs) you have such a royal name. Can I, I I forgot to mention that. Uh, Louis Montuli II, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, my name has been passed down through many generations of Italian families, and it was Luigi. And uh, my uh, great grandfather uh, had his name changed when he came through Ellis Island, uh, as they did. And uh, Montuli wasn't the original name either. It was probably Mentulo or one of those other variations, because Montuli is almost unique in the world. There aren't, there aren't Montulis that exist in Italy, as far as I know. And the only ones that I've found in the United States are relatives of mine. Uh, so it appears to be a unique variation that was or, uh, originated at Ellis Island. Wow. That's actually probably very helpful for the uh, Google search. <laughs> That's Indeed, just yeah. like uh, Strumsky. They changed the I to a Y. And you don't usually see that in Poland. So. Yeah, I was able to get my own domain name. That is good. <laughs> Doesn't happen with Smith. No, that would never happen with Smith. Uh, so thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I love podcasts. I, I spend all of my driving life listening to them, and I feel, I feel like I'm better educated because of so many different podcasts. So uh, thank you for the work you do and for all the podcasts out there. Well, you are very lucky because you're in California. So when you drive, you see good stuff. And in DC, you listen to podcasts when you're in traffic. That's the difference between us. Uh, I hate to burst your bubble, but here it's all traffic all the time. <laughs> I mean, there are some beautiful highways. I grant you that. But uh, within the Bay Area, it's it's traffic. And certainly LA, it's traffic. It's so, still bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Although, hey, we're getting self-driving cars, so. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> One of these days. One of these days, yeah. Well, it's got to start somewhere, right? So you're originally from Kansas, correct? Yeah, so I have uh, a many, many states that I called home in my early, early childhood. Uh, I was in Kansas to finish high school, and then I went to university, uh, University of Kansas. Okay. And just like we were talking before, uh, we started, you were uh, going back and forth. Your dad was in the Air Force. Yeah, my uh, father was career Air Force. He uh, he was the first in his family to go to college, and he uh, enrolled in the Air Force to help pay for his college education, and he went on to get a, uh, all the way to get a doctorate at uh, UCLA, yeah, paid for That's by awesome. the military. Uh, and then he served, uh, I think, 24 or 26 years in the Air Force. Um, so they got a good deal out of that. They, they got a PhD uh, engineer, uh, and he worked on missile systems, uh, nuclear weapon systems, and uh, stealth uh, aircraft, and a whole bunch of other projects in his, in his career. And the then, fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm, sh- I'm sure it was a lot of... Uh, the military is always hurry up and wait, but uh, he did get to work on some fun projects, and... Uh, prior to prior to Wichita, uh, he was based uh, in Washington D.C., where he was working on the MX missile system and was uh, you know, stationed at the White House, uh, working to try to promote that uh, that system within because it needed funding and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, we were in Washington D.C. area 
uh, for I think about eight years prior to moving to Kansas. And so with your dad's uh, background, were they pushing college or was that something that was just always your drive? He definitely valued education, although we didn't always see eye to eye on, on especially my grades. Uh, I was, uh, I was, I've always been a terrible student. I, I can't exactly explain why, because uh, I certainly when I attach to a subject, I do well at it. But I think school uh, represented, there, was, there were several challenges for me, especially at the schools uh, just outside of the D.C. area. And then additionally, I have a real problem with studying things that I don't have, that I don't believe they're, they have a purpose to me. And many educational systems just present information without actually telling you why you should learn something. Mm -hmm. uh, when I have a good reason to do something, I'm, I voraciously devour it and I get it done. Uh, but uh, when somebody's trying to teach me something and I don't really care, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really go in. <laughs> very well hard to do homework and that sort of thing it seems like a common uh malaise uh, for a lot of people and then other people really attach to school and 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 love the process and mm -hmm. and and get it but i wasn't one of those people yeah so once you moved to kansas you said your first programming class i guess that's when it kind of uh you attach to the subject you would say yeah, well, that was my first taste. Uh, honestly, I took the class because I heard that it was a good opportunity to just uh, goof off. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was computers and you know, you, the idea of playing video games or you know, whatever came to my mind. But I, I did take a computer course in high school. And the, the, nowadays these are very common, but back then it was you know, probably the first of its kind in our, in our school district. Uh, just even having PCs around was a pretty rare thing. So there was it was just a lab of maybe six or eight computers, and they had a course. And somebody who didn't know very much about programming or computers in general was teaching it. Um, and, but he met really well, and he tried to guide us. Uh, but a lot of the time was spent just fooling around. Uh, but we did actually learn how to do simple programs. And I realized at that time, or at least the th my takeaway from that was that this stuff is pretty simple. It's just some simple keywords and, and the computer does something and it's, it's, not, um, it's not something to be afraid of, uh, if you would. So uh, many people look at all the code on a screen and go, I could never do that. Um, but if you just start trying and you, you start small, the, the reality is this stuff is, is very simple. It only gets complicated as you build it up over and over. Just like a Lego is very simple, but you could build a very large, complex uh, structure from it. The same with code. And just to give a frame of reference, this was around like 1989, 88, something like that? Uh, this would have been like 1983, 1984, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I graduated high school in 1988, so yeah, maybe 84, 85, something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... Even from these remarks, it was amazing to have a computer in school then, right? Like... It was, yeah. yeah they, were, it, they were pretty rare. Uh, the other early influence I had is I think sometime around 1986. I, I can't recall exactly, but my father bought a, a early PC clone. It was like a Zenith something, some mm -hmm. knockoff. It had, um, it had one megabyte of RAM, which was amazing because the, the uh, Windows could only access 768K of RAM. So it had more RAM than it was Windows. Than the actual DOS. computer. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the operating system didn't know how to actually access that much RAM at the time. Uh, and, you know, just to put that in perspective, an, an MP3 is about five megabytes, right? So it, it, the computer had one-fifth of the memory that could play just one song much less the power to play a song. So uh, those are the kinds of computers that we were dealing with in the 80s. But, you know, just to, to, in, his, in time and history, right, it was still amazing, right? You go back 10 years before that and everything was a mainframe. It took up the size of a, a large room or a house. So uh, things were moving very quickly in the computer world at that time. It's just crazy to me just to think back then, because obviously I grew up where I think Windows 95 was my first uh, operating system. And I think it's gone dramatically. You, you know, even more than I, I do on the, the stretch of where it was and where it is now. It's just yeah. baffling. Yeah. 
it it uh, it's been a remarkable progression, especially when you move from the world of command line interfaces to graphical user interfaces. But I would also I would predict hasten to hasten to do predictions because Nostradamus is always wrong. Uh, but uh, I think in the same span of your life, you're going to look back and say that everything has changed as much or more than what I've seen. Right? Like computers, you know, may be literally inside your head in in a similar time frame or maybe so ubiquitous that you can't imagine going anywhere without a computer always around you. I mean, it's almost the case today. You have a phone, which is a very powerful computer compared to what we had in the 80s, uh, always with you. So you have you have what is essentially a hundred times more power than, or maybe even a thousand times more powerful than um, any of the computers we had in the 80s, right in your pocket all the time. And it can potentially listen to your voice and respond to you. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. What you bring up, it makes me think of, uh, like I used to see those chapter books, like those scientific novels with the, uh, what they thought the future was going to be like in 30 <laughs> years. And it was just like, whatever they had then, but they would put, I don't know, antennas on it and say it was something, you know, right. whereas w what they show today, I can't even imagine. Maybe it'll be closer, but. Yeah, futurists are often limited by the ideas that are already in their head. So they see a car and they say, well, let's make a flying car. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you see a television and they say, put the television on the watch or on your wrist or something like that. But the, the real breakthroughs are things that we can't imagine. Uh, those are the, the real genre breakers, the things that come come out and 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 do something amazing. And uh, you know, now that we're on the topic, I think the internet, the networking, uh, the world of networking, the World Wide Web, is one of those things. It could not have. It was certainly not predicted by those who were predicting flying cars in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like a paradox where if it would have been thought of, then they would have already been working on it. Exactly. I mean, there are some cases where science fiction writers have come up with with ideas of the the metaverse is is one of those the metaverse has been around as an idea for a really long time now and we're just so far from having the technology to realize such a thing a you know virtual reality that feels real enough that people could essentially live there or experience much of their social life there i um, mean we see tastes of that and people in in organized multiplayer online games and things like that. But the idea of the metaverse has been around for a really long time in science fiction novels. Um, and we're still a long ways from, from getting there. So after your coding class, you decided I'm going to go to Kansas University. You saw the program there. I wish I could say it was that simple. So again, I, I was a terrible student. Um, I, I was dealing with a lot from my time in, um, just outside of Washington, D.C. So uh, in the, you may be familiar with this, but the military does not earn a particularly high paycheck. And when you move to an expensive area, you have the choice of living on base or you can you get a housing allowance, but the housing allowance is very minuscule. Um, so we lived in a not so great neighborhood. Um, the, the neighborhood, like the immediate street we're on was uh, pretty decent, but the neighborhood we were in was... Um, was a, 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 a very low income neighborhood. Um, and I went to public schools and I was in a, uh, it was a 90% minority public school. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, I think the teachers really meant well. I don't really have memories of, of the teachers, but what I do remember quite strongly is that as the, as the white minority within my high school or within my grade school, uh, all the shit ran downhill to me. So. It was it was a really difficult time, and uh, it was times when I kind of feared for my safety, and, and legitimately so. Um, so I was I was in a very difficult place uh, in those days, and very confused, and I didn't really understand why I was forced to be there. So school was a really negative experience for me early on, and that could have been what led to me not really caring at all for for school. But uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I would say that moving to Wichita, uh, you know, saved me in, in, in many dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, coming from, uh, from Washington, D.C., I saw uh, a lot of violence and I wasn't 
particularly prepared for it, but at least I understood it, and I knew that um, violence begets violence, and I at least, because, you know, hundreds of people had tried to beat me up before, I had some self-defense capabilities, although not particularly well organized, and so moving to Kansas, um, I set about to kind of uh, reinvent uh, myself, at least to make sure that I wasn't the victim anymore, and, you know, I'm not particularly proud of some of the things I did at that time, but uh, I quickly established myself that uh, that violence begat violence right back. And uh, after the first year, you know, I didn't have any troubles with anybody trying to like beat me up or or harass me. So I I solved that part, but I still wasn't like super uh, social or otherwise normal. Um, it took. I think it took the entire time of high school for me to come out out of whatever funk I was in, and become uh, what I would consider kind of the me that is that is uh, you know more similar to me now. Um, I remember very distinctly sometime in my uh, junior or senior year. Sorry, this is a little uncomfortable for me to talk, about, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I don't talk about this very often. But um, I remember. Uh, uh, having kind of an epiphany that life is full of opportunities and that I want to I want to now just go out and take advantage of them all. I want to just go out and live everything I can. And I, that was a foreign feeling to me in the, in, uh, in the prior years of my childhood. So I just started to do everything that I possibly could and, and exploring all these different avenues and not really caring, you know, what, you know, wasn't necessarily prepared for any of these things, but I just started doing them. Um, and I think that set the stage for a lot of the things, a lot of good things that started happening to me in the following four or five years. That's awesome. So I guess you get to college, you get to your senior year, you made it there, computer science, and... Oh, we missed the best part. What was the best I, part? I'm sorry. I, my plan when I left high school was to join the army. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so I literally did not apply to any schools. Uh, I had no, I, uh, I, I had nothing lined up. I was going to join the army. Um, and uh, it was July of 1988. And uh, one of my friends came over and we were hanging out. And he said, you know, he asked, he kind of knew what I was going to do. And he, he says to me, he says, well, I'm going to the University of Kansas. I think you should just join me there and we'll figure it out. And for whatever reason, at that particular day, I thought, like, why not? Let's give it a try. Because uh, maybe it was that I had gone down to the military recruiting statement at the station and <laughs> started to have second thoughts. <laughs> I can't exactly remember why, but uh, that was a very fateful day. I said, okay, well, let me see if I can make this work. And back then, um, the even though I, you know, I had terrible grades, they had a um, entry requirement that the Kansas schools had to take you if you had a test score above a certain, certain level. And um, I may not have been uh, get, I may not have gotten good grades, but my test scores were quite high. Uh, so I must have learned something while sitting <laughs> in those courses, pretending to be grumpy. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly, but I, I made it to college. So I did actually get to the University of Kansas and I found, um, I took some ROTC courses to see if I really wanted to be in the military. I realized that that was definitely not my personality because they were just like yelling at you. Stand, yeah, yelling at me, go stand over there, salute me now. And I, oh, this is definitely not for me. So I, I uh, quickly unenrolled from that and I said, okay, uh, I want to stay in college. Uh, my parents had set some money aside, but it wasn't a, a, a very large amount of money. So uh, I, re I had to get a job uh, just to pay for school. Now, fortunately, back in those days, schools was way more affordable. You could work a part-time job and you could pay for school. So um, please don't hate me for this, all of you students who are paying absorbent rates. But my, my per, uh, per semester tuition was $600 uh, a semester, which is ridiculously low compared to now. I think University of Kansas is now 30, uh, like 28,000 a year or something uh, for out of state. Well, is... you have two children, so you'll see that soon, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I have a daughter in college right now, so I'm certainly paying full rates now. 
there you go. It <laughs> comes full circle. Yeah. Yeah. One other note I have, because like I said, I scoured the internet. I saw mm-hmm. conflicting things that said, well, not conflicting, one conflicting story that said you were six credits short of your uh, college degree, but you were still working at the university. Well, you... so I was I was enrolled the entire time I was at uh, the university. I took the last semester essentially off. I just took my last two, uh, the last two courses I needed to graduate uh, in uh, correspondence school. They have like, uh, you know, just mail it in. And it was meteorology and religion. Um, and I never got around to actually finishing those courses. So I didn't receive an official degree. I think that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, like, no, 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 I'm serious. I'm serious. It's just like you were more concerned with the actual art than the actual, like you were interested, like since high school doing coding with Pascal, you were more interested in kind of, cause I'm familiar with coding. It's like, you don't see it until you see it, if that makes sense, like the flow of it. Mm-hmm. And it's the worst part is when you run it and it works perfectly. So you know it's completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's unlikely to run perfectly at the, at the start. That is absolutely true, unless it's very simple. Uh, so I'm at the university, and uh, I need to get a job. Um, and I'd worked, I'd worked at uh, it's a retail. I'd worked at Target uh, for a couple of summers and during high school. And I worked at Disney World for a summer. I was uh, I was a Jungle Cruise captain. So I got to tell jokes and pretend to drive a boat. Uh, just... Fun fact, did you know Steve Martin uh, worked at Disney Disneyland when he was 10? Oh, nice. I didn't know that. <laughs> the most interesting thing that happened to me while working at Disney World is uh, if you've been on the Jungle Cruise, it's, it's the, the boat captain takes you on a tour and tells really corny jokes. And it's the same corny jokes over and over and over again. So you have a script. Uh, you spend the first week just doing the script over and over and over again to an empty boat, and then you take on passengers. And I spent three or four months doing that. Um, one would think that you can't daydream while doing a full monologue, but it turns out you can. <laughs> I found myself daydreaming and like coming back to reality and finding myself in front of a crowd of people, <laughs> not knowing where I was. <laughs> it's like. Huh, I think I'm monologuing here, but I don't know exactly where. I'm familiar with the ride. And last time I went on it, you didn't actually have to drive. Did you have to drive it back then? Yeah, it's on rails, but there is a throttle. So you just simply move forward or stop. Okay, right? that's uh, good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, it, it's, we're not going to crash the boat, fortunately. So yeah, it was mostly puns and you were driving around on a rail basically the whole time. So yeah, yeah. nobody was hurt. That's a good thing. Only the puns hurt them. Exactly, and they they had a they had a twenty two pistol on board. Uh, really? They were supposed to shoot the uh, shoot at the hippos or shoot into the air. I think they've since gotten rid of that entirely because uh, yeah, you're not supposed to shoot at hippos for sure. But it turns with out a gun. with a gun, yeah. Somebody brought live ammunition to um, to the ride, <laughs> not during my tenure, but a few years before, and actually shot the hippos. Uh, and they had since plugged all the guns uh, properly. <laughs> Why the hell were they using real 22s in the first place? I don't know. A fake one was much more expensive than a, a real one, probably. Exactly. Exactly. So trying to find out a way to make some money without having a job that I hated. So I... <laughs> isn't, isn't that the main story of everybody, right? It is. Like That's the meaning of life, indeed. Uh, so I went to the computer center, uh, which we, we had, uh, we had a computer center at the university and back in those days, it, uh, they have a bunch of mainframes and things, um, which are just big computers in a big room that are the size of large refrigerators or buses or depending, depending on the year. Uh, and they needed people to work these giant printers or to change tapes. If you watch Dr. Shivago, they have these beautiful round tapes that are spinning and that's how we stored data back in those days uh, and the tapes were not that big and so in order to run a program you'd have to swap the tapes many times to read and write all the data and these were the computers that ran like the class schedules and printed out grades and and uh, basically handled the correspondence for the university 
Uh, so that was that was my fateful entry into the world of, of computers. The stepping stone. Yes. Uh, running printers and changing <laughs> changing vacuum tapes. Uh, uh, so um, thus begins another th uh, a, a real theme of my life is that I get bored easily. Um, I really enjoy the process of getting good at something, uh, but there's only so much to learn about putting a tape onto a round reel or running a printer. Uh, I got pretty good at doing those things and then quickly found myself bored. Uh, but it was during that time that I discovered that there, that our university was connected to something called the ARPANET, which is the uh, the earliest embodiment embodiment of the internet as we know it. Our university was part of um, a network of other universities that had a interconnected network, and then that network interconnected to several other networks that other universities were on, and, and there was even a few companies. I think maybe Intel and and digital equipment uh, corporation they were on the internet of those of that day but it was mostly universities and at the time the use of the of the network was really limited to something that looked like a bulletin board so like um, a little bit like facebook but totally different <laughs> yeah uh very like public it was basically they had subjects that you could pu uh, publish uh a um you know a a message to, and then people could reply to it. Uh, and you could have these long running replies uh, and you could read it. And you know, sometimes it was entertaining and sometimes it was informative and sometimes it was disgusting, but it was, it was all just like new and different. And uh, it was, it was beautiful. It was really the moment. Never I saw been it, done I, before. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely new. Uh, there had been these bulletin board things where you'd connect by a modem. That was kind of a big thing in the eighties. But it was limited to a few users at a time, and then AOL was emerging at that time as a as a as a thing. Maybe that wasn't even around in you know in the late '80s. I'm not sure when they actually started, but that sort of thing. Uh, but the the internet was really fascinating, and there was a lot of university students and faculty at, uh, already connected to it. So you know, at least a hundred thousand people in some way had access to to the university computers around them and could access the internet if they knew anything about it. But most didn't know how to use it because it was all like type in text commands and, and something would happen. Uh, but you could do a lot of the things that we do today. You could download files from another computer. Uh, you could upload messages. Uh, you, could, you could do, you know, the network was there, but it wasn't doing any of the, any of the magic things that we associate it with today. And the, the bandwidth was, they're very small in comparison to today. So I was bored. I, I eventually was able to make my way up to a help desk support position. So that's basically uh, helping people run their computers when they had problems. So there's faculty and staff. And that was more interesting because the difference of problems was uh, you know, a lot more broad. And so learning all of that was really fun for I don't know, six months for a year and, uh, or a year. And then I got bored of doing that. Uh, and I started looking for something else to do. Uh, and our university had this long running project to put up a campus wide information system. The idea was to allow people who were on the network because we had a campus network. It was, it was very primitive in those days. It wasn't like uh, students could connect over the internet to the university. It was students could use a modem to connect their computer to the university or they could go to one of the computer labs and get on a computer that was connected to the network. Uh, and the project was to put an information system up, uh, which is what we would know today as a website, uh, but people didn't have that back then. Uh, and th we started, there, the project had been ongoing for a while and uh, the person who was in charge of it didn't find anything that they found to their liking. Uh, and I had talked to him about it a bunch and he had shown me all the different software uh, things that they had, they had tried. And, um, there was a there was a product called Gopher back in those days, and uh, it was Gopher spelled like the animal. Uh, and the Gopher was was pretty interesting. It could go to any computer on the internet, uh, but its interface was really was very basic. It basically presented a list of of, of options labeled one through ten, and then you would you'd say okay, uh, you read all the options, you select one, and it would go 
to that and then it would present you another list of options and you know one through ten and eventually it would take you somewhere like a document or uh, you know or a an image or something like that uh, so it allowed it allowed you to uh, traverse the network in a way where you didn't have to know anything about the network. So you didn't have to know what a host name was or how to type in a command to go get it. And so it was, it was very simple, uh, easy to use, but what it really lacked was a, any kind of interesting user interface. You know, seeing a bunch of numbers on the screen is not going to get anybody very excited about <laughs> using an information yeah. system. You want your mom or your dad at some point to actually be interested in it. And exactly what it looks like a golden eye screen. Boris and uh, I forget the female's name, but <laughs> Natasha. Natasha, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, uh, I, I knew about this, and I it was pretty cool software. Uh, it was also open source software, um, and that's when I started learning about open source software, which is this kind of interesting concept where people create something and then they just give away the you know everything, the whole plans, everything. When you give away your your source code, you're giving away the keys to the kingdom, essentially. Um, and I didn't really understand why people did that at, at first. Um, but then it dawned on me, like, uh, it, it would, if, if I was able to create an open source software program, that I might be able to get a job <laughs> doing programming, right? <laughs> Which was, again, the meaning of life is trying to find a job that doesn't suck. Right, so the, <laughs> the I think that, I think that's the the name of the episode. The the thought in my head was like I really should create an open source program, and then I would be associated with something that it was a proof that I could do something. Because again, I was I was learning. I really enjoyed the university, but I hate doing homework. I don't like doing busy work. All those things. So I was I was learning, but I was not an excellent student uh, as the. As the grades would show um, at the end, I was you know pretty pretty darn mediocre or, le or worse than mediocre. Uh, you know, if you can build something, if you can actually prove that you can do something, that's uh, that's uh, that's probably better than getting an A in in history. Yeah, that's at least my thought process. Um, so then the other little bit that made everything fall in place for me, uh, I saw this program called Hyperes, which was a hypertext program, and I didn't really know what hypertext was. I, I had read I had read, read a science fiction book that talked about hypertext like in uh, sometime in high school. So I had this concept, but that was more of like a, a high level like science fiction thing. But hypertext was actually real, right? You could have uh, this program Hyperes could network together a bunch of documents on your local computer and you could read the document. It looks like a, a well formatted document and within the document you have links that you can click. Uh, we didn't have mice back then. You'd have to actually like press the tab, <laughs> you, tab, tab. Yeah, yeah, yeah tab, tab, tab. Um, and uh, you click the link, uh, and and uh, you go to the next page. And, and to me, that was a beautiful interface. And so that was Hyperes. And so I knew Gopher existed. I knew Hyperes existed. I had the source code to both of them. And I said, uh, Well, what if? What if your chocolate got into my peanut butter? What if, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like, that's I, such a good metaphor. Yeah, I just I had no idea what I was doing uh, because I the, these both these programs were written in a language called C, uh, which is now I know is a notoriously difficult language. It's not as hard as assembly, obviously, but C is a, a finicky low-level language. But I just had the hubris to think I'm going to give it a try, and I spent all night and I just mesh these programs together the best I could to create a proof of concept to show that we could take hyper uh, hypertext and make it into a network hypertext environment and you could just put this into uh, on the computers and you could now access information on multiple computers okay you know you're saying wow that's that's amazing but it turns out you know like other people were already working on very similar concepts so Tim Berners-Lee unbeknownst to me, has created this thing called the World Wide Web about mm, probably six months earlier. Uh, and it was probably gestating in his head for many years before. The guy is an extreme visionary and, and, and likes to think about things. The difference was, is I was a, I guess you could say I'm a builder and he's a big thinker, right? He likes to think about um, how all systems work together and the, and the beauty of them and how they can affect society and these other things. And he's spending all his time thinking about that. And I'm thinking about, well, I just want to make something. 
And so I made something, uh, and Lynx was used by the university, and I open sourced it, and it started to get picked up by other universities. And uh, meanwhile, back at CERN, World Wide Web is is building up, right? They're 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 building some steam. I have no idea this is going on, but it's these parallel universes, um, essentially doing the same thing. I will I will say with absolute uh, conviction that what what Tim conceived of in terms of the protocols, the standards, the HTML, that sort of thing, was much better thought out. Like I was basically just in there hacking together things and making them. I took something that was not particularly well designed and made it better. Um, and starting from you know relative, you know difficult design is not a great way to create to create a beautiful uh, product. So I had something that worked, but it was not terribly elegant. Uh, so Tim's project is going forward, and again in this parallel universe, uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina start working on this project called Mosaic, which took the World Wide Web concept and put a nice user interface on it. And they wrote this in a um, in an environment called X Windows, which is the Windows for a Unix computer. So if you're used to running on a Mac or a PC, you know what Windows look like. Um, these all ran on, on very expensive um, uh, uh, Unix computers. Uh, some incredibly cool concepts around X Windows. It's like a networked uh, windowing system, so you don't have to be in the same room as the computer. It's like it's, it was way ahead of its time, which is also why it failed spectacularly. It was <laughs> it was way ahead of its time. <laughs> it tried to do way too much, um, but Mosaic is this, uh, cr uh, what. Uh, what Eric and Mark created was a beautiful embodiment of, of what the web could look like. Um, the only downside was uh, only about uh, like tens of thousands of people in the world could possibly run this thing because you needed a Unix uh, machine with X windows on it. So it represented the most beautiful embodiment. It created a lot of PR and hype around what is, was possible with the World Wide Web. And that's when I saw I saw what it could do, and I realized I'm essentially trying to do the same thing. I just need to I need to go I take a little bit of a, a turn here, and you know take take what the web has done and make that you know, make that part of links. So uh, within about six weeks' time after seeing uh, the World Wide Web, Links became a, a true web browser. It didn't look any different, but instead of using the formats that that Lynx had originally used, and, uh, and Gopher as the back end, uh, re-architected it to use to use all the web standards and HTML and that sort of thing, um, and then had a true web browser. So that's when Lynx became a web browser. Uh, I think that was in 1992. Um, so at that point, uh, the, we've got this beautiful program mosaic. We've got Lynx, which is functionally very useful. It doesn't look that great. I mean, you could still see it today. It's still around, it's still uh, available on all Linux computers. It's it's a bunch of text with with links, but you have to use your arrow keys and it'll make around. you feel nostalgic. That's... <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> I believe me. I don't. I don't uh, love that. Uh, I don't. I don't yearn for that kind of nostalgia. I I, I love. <laughs> I, lo I love me a fast computer. Uh, uh, it's it's cool to see, but uh, I'm I'm not upset that we've left that world behind. It's still useful on occasion. I still fire up links because you know, as a computer programmer, I'm oftentimes in an environment where I don't have a full windowed environment, like in a in a server room or something like that. So it's it's still useful, but it's it's not fun to use in the same way, and it can't show images or videos or any of the things that people know on the web today. Uh, so. It was at that point when we started to have many people working on the web and many embodiments of it, so multiple platforms. Uh, shortly after, uh, I think it maybe it took six months or a year, uh, but other other web uh, browsers for the for the PC, Windows 3.1 was coming out kind of right around that time, and that was the first viable Windows um, windowing environment for the PC. <coughs> like Windows 2 was a complete failure. Windows 1 was unspeakable. Uh, it was <laughs> unspeakable evil. Uh, yeah, it, it it takes Microsoft three tries every time to make something that is a is a is a good product. Uh, but 3.1 was you know, the first one that really started to catch on, and so there was browsers for Windows, browsers for Mac. Um, all these things started to come about, and it's that point that the the 
the Sick. snowball really started to roll. Yeah, yeah. So we got we started to really take off, and uh, you know we'll, maybe we'll put a pin in this because everyone knows where the web goes from here. <laughs> it it got really popular, is the hint. So, kind of talk me through. I guess uh, I guess you're specific. You guys building up Netscape. Tell me about the meeting between the first meeting where you guys started talking about it, where you had to fly to Chicago. What was that like? Yeah, so I'll just back the story up just a hair because I, so I was a I was an athlete um, prior to becoming uh, a computer programmer. I, w I played uh, uh, racquetball on the university team, and uh, at just prior to this meeting, uh, I was I was at the um, at the collegiate world championships, which was down in Texas. Uh, it was nobody plays racquetball anymore. I'm such an anachronism. I got to learn pickleball. It's the new thing. Uh, anyways, I, I had just literally just flown back and I, I had just drove back from the airport and I checked my voicemail. You know, people actually used voicemail back then. Uh, and it was on a, you know, a hard line. So I didn't have access to it. No cell phones. And I got this voicemail, uh, from, um, this, uh, Jim Clark's assistant, uh, and, uh, said, uh, Jim is flying out to Illinois and wants you to meet him there. Go to the airport, get on a plane <laughs> and, meet, and, and meet him in Illinois. And, um, I was like, Oh, is this for real? So <laughs> I, so I called back the number and I talked to Deanne, who is just a lovely person. Um, she came to Netscape when we created the company as well. So I got to know her really well. Um, and, uh, and I said, I basically explained, I have no money. <laughs> uh, uh, is this for real? Uh, and she said, yes. Do you have a credit card? And I go, yes. Uh, like <laughs> it, it could bankrupt me. Uh, but, uh, she goes, just go. I promise you we will, we'll, we'll reimburse you. And so I was, uh, uh, I had some hint of this cause I, I, I'd known Mark Andreessen for a number of years, uh, through email correspondence and we had met at a conference. And so I knew that this was potentially coming up and, and been holding off on all other job offers. And so I knew this was potentially there, but the idea of just like driving directly back to the airport and buying a ticket at the retail counter, uh, you know, it just, it was, it was something that I had never even, uh, conceived of doing before. So that's what I did. I drove back to the airport. I went up to the counter. I said, uh, can I buy a ticket to Illinois? <laughs> They're like, yes, you can. <laughs> it will cost you this much. <laughs> and I swallowed really hard, gave them my credit card and I went on a, uh, got on a plane. Uh, and the, uh, we, I get there and it turns out I beat, um, Jim and Mark uh, who were flying from California, even though they had a, like an eight hour head start, they got stuck in Chicago on a, in a snowstorm. This was, uh, I think in February or March or something, probably February. Um, and so I, I got there a little early, started hanging out with some of the other guys I knew at the NCSA development team, the guys who had worked on Mosaic, uh, which was again, one of the really early web browsers, uh, and, uh, got to hang out and then Mark and Jim showed up and you know, I, I knew this was coming. Like it was, is the right thing to do. Like we have this immensely popular thing that has millions of users and is growing, you know, massively every single month. Uh, it's, it definitely feels like we're building something that matters. Um, there was all this hype around uh, the government creating the information superhighway and wanting to fund, you know, these, uh, this, this idea. And we were very influenced by this. We, we thought what we were building should be the information highway and that the way to do it was to do it through open source software, to have everything be free and open, have the standards owned by humanity and not owned by a single person. And all of our competition, AOL, MSN, uh, they were closed networks that were owned entirely by one large corporation. If you, if you wanted to be on their network as a, as a business or a user, you had to pay. You know? And so, we we very libertarian libertarian leaning college students who are like just set the information free and the world will the world will you know just be so much better. Um, it was yeah a lot of um, 
yeah, a lot of youthful exuberance. <laughs> All right, so I, I understand those libertarian leanings, even though I'm not a, not quite as libertarian anymore. Uh, the uh, our we we felt like we were on a mission to create something for the planet in some ways. Um, and then Jim gave uh, J Jim Clark. Um, I should give some backstory here. So Jim Clark, um, it was already a famous entrepreneur. Uh, he was uh, a um, Stanford uh, computer science professor. And he uh, founded the company um, uh, Silicon Graphics, and they were a major player in the Unix workstation market and pioneered the idea of graphics cards and computer graphics. Um, just a really, a really big player uh, in the game. And he had just recently left SGI under not great terms. He had hired a CEO to you know, run the company, and then the CEO essentially ousted him, and he was. He was out for blood, so <laughs> which is a good place to be for us, right? Where yeah. he's like, "I want to succeed. We're going to go out there and and change the world." Uh, and uh, it, Jim still has a lot of this vigor in him, but it's certainly in those days he is incredibly passionate, really well spoken. We each had a private meeting with with Jim because it was for most of us our first time meeting him, and we all came out and kind of compared notes about the, the, uh, the experience. And I don't remember who, who, uh, who came up with this concept, but, uh, we all very much agreed that he was doing Jedi mind tricks on us. He was like, these are not the droids you're looking for, right? Like he could have convinced us to do anything in that moment. And what he convinced us of was that we were going to go, we were going to go to California. We we're going to start a company. We we're going to, uh, we were going to make the best possible versions of web browsers and web servers, and we were going to change the world. That nothing else. So you're just going to go and you're going to change the whole freaking world, uh, and we're going to make money at it. Uh, I honestly, at that time, didn't care that much about the money. I, I personally thought that anyone who made more than a million dollars ever was probably like a uh, you know capitalist pig from. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it. That's what it was like then. Like most cases, right? You got well, oil yeah. and yeah. I mean, I've 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 since come to understand economics a little better, and I you know I, I'm not a, I I don't agree that I I don't think we should have such great economic disparity in our country, but I also think that it is possible for an individual to dr to generate tremendous individual value, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you know we could we could point to some things like Einstein or something. Somebody who is generationally talented ought to. You know, is capable of, of, of completely revolutionizing certain areas. And you know, the, the, ec the, the, the economics should flow to the source, right? We ought to incent people. You know, you know, I don't want to get into politics of, of money distribution, but uh, certainly there is this capability through software for a small number of people to greatly affect the economy and have a large amount of money flow to that. Now, whether the government should be taxing us a lot more or otherwise uh, to equalize income distributions, that sort of thing, those are, those are really good societal questions that I, I'm supportive, and supportive of and, and love to talk more about that, but that's, that's not the subject of this. So we have this mission uh, now. We're going go, to go to California, and we're going to rebuild everything, and we're going to change the world. Simple, right? <laughs> But again, we're all young college students. I was I was 23 at the time. Uh, Mark was 22. Eric was uh, uh, he was a little older. Uh, but we were all young, and uh, we had no attachments. Not, uh, you know, we were just basically free, and we could go. We could move to California, and we could work 24/7 to to realize the the dream we had of changing the world. And we literally worked as close to 24/7 as possible for. You know that time period of completely rebuilding the the early products that we had originally built. Yeah, I saw uh, some articles saying that you would work thirteen hours straight, take a three or four hour nap, go at it again for another thirteen hours, and then head home just to check in on the the cat or the goldfish or whatever, <laughs> and then go at it again. Yeah, I had none of those things, the cat or the goldfish. I had a futon on the floor. Of a of an of an apartment, <laughs> basically no furniture, and that's, <laughs> and that's probably back when uh, San Francisco was a little bit cheaper than it is now. Beautiful two bedroom apartment for one thousand dollars a month. <laughs> that's crazy. 
crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very crazy in retrospect. Uh, yeah, so the, that that ability to work those crazy hours was really predicated on our on our prior work experience. So when you when when you typically go about building a product, there's a ton of time spent thinking deeply about about what you want to build, how to build it, architectures, second and third order problems that could prop up. You really have to think very carefully about architectures and um, and you know product horizons and directions as you build. Like you don't have to know what everything up front. Uh, you could try to learn everything up front, but that you know you probably won't you won't you won't see it all. But you you have to. You have to stop quite frequently and say, "Well, I just ran across this problem. How are we going to solve that?" And or, you know, you're constantly running up unforeseen problems. So the benefit we had is we had just spent uh, three years, or I had spent three years working on you know, one of the first web browsers, and so I knew all the problems already. Like I had already built this thing, and so what we were trying to do is build a much better version of it, something that didn't crash all the time, something that was faster. Uh, faster, better, stronger, six million dollar web browser, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, we we really could just work much, much faster and longer because it was just program, 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 rebuild everything that we knew how to build, and then start thinking about next generation. Um, and you know that was in that kind of thought process that we came up with cookies and many other many other um, things that uh, are just standard parts of the web today. Well, the awesome thing is you guys were, you're pioneers, not like nowadays with probably about, I don't know, 60, 70% of coding, it's kind of, you're recycling some of the same stuff, but for different applications, different uses, but you guys were basically building out stuff that had never, the creator of cookies right here. <laughs> yeah. It had never been done before, but like you've mentioned before, it's literally a text file that's less, what was it, 400 kilobytes? Not yeah, The cookie itself is limited in size to very small, just 4K each one. Uh, but you you couldn't, uh, you could you can't have more than a certain number because otherwise a, comp a, a website might denial of service your whole computer by filling up the hard drive or other things. So there's a, a bunch of extreme limits on it because computers in those days, uh, you know, if you had a 30 megabyte hard drive back in like 1994, you were, you're you're pretty wealthy. <laughs> yeah, it's in my like I said, I have such a short span. But back back in the '90s, it was like more not space, but more backing up everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays, you've got automatic backups most of the time. Yeah. But it's just funny how the vibe changes every ten years, and then in another ten years, you want to make sure your meta self is backed up. Or you're gonna lose your. <laughs> Wouldn't that be beautiful? Just before you go skydiving, just back yourself up and. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Exactly. That'd but be beautiful. Like I said, you guys were pioneering tons of things. Like you had your uh, the second live video with uh, the fish going in. Yeah, yeah. The fish cam was the second live camera on the internet. The very first one was the. Um, at Oxford, I think it was, or Cambridge, Cambridge Coffee Pot. It was a, uh, a prestigious school in England. They put a camera, a very small, low resolution camera on a coffee pot and then put it on their internet uh, and eventually opened up the whole internet. Um, and that ins I saw that and it inspired me to, to put up a similar thing and the fish tank was a lot more interesting. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> like you could choose something so much better. Uh, so I assume you never had to change the fish either. It never died, right? <laughs> I wish I could say that, but uh, yeah. So the fish cam was, you know, a little bit of a, you know, a just a side project, but it ended up being one of the ways that we tested out uh, almost all the new technologies in HTML and JavaScript and and many other of the interactive technologies that we were building, because it. Uh, it was something that we had in-house, right? So I could test out new ideas on it as an actual embodiment of something that people might use and then um, use it as an example, right? When we'd release a new web browser of all the cool things that you could do with our new features. Uh, uh, so it, was, it, wasn't, it became more than just a you know, fun little side hobby, even though it still was, uh, but it was, it was fun to do. And it, at, uh, in the early days, um, 
it was getting quite a bit of traffic because back when the web was young, there wasn't as much to see. <laughs> so a lot of people come see the fish tank. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it was it was one of the more visited pages on the internet back in the in the 90s. Uh, and it's mostly faded into obscurity now. And it's right now not even pointing at a fish tank, I have to say. It's pointing out my window because our fish tank got uh, removed during COVID. The fish were are all in a good space. They got moved to other tanks, but I no longer have an office fish tank, so I got to find a new space for that uh, for the fish cam. So anyone listening to this who has a beautiful fish tank and wants to volunteer, uh, please yeah. let me know. Just send it all the way to California as well. <laughs> hey, it's the internet. You can be anywhere with this, with this camera. That's true. Uh, so you could say you were the first streaming service too. In, in a way, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into these other streaming services, but uh, and I also want to. I want to clarify you know, these the ideas that that are were considered new uh, are really you know retreads of various things that are already happening in the physical world or in other parts of of the computer world. So we were um, we were a group of people innovating as fast as we could, and we were taking influences from wherever we could find it. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to put a, to pinpoint where those influences came from, but um, you know, very, it's 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 rare. I can't point to anything that I've ever created where I wasn't I hadn't seen something that was kind of you know, subtly similar in some other space. That is like, oh, that's a good idea. I wonder what that would be like if we networked it. Right? It's like this this great um, unbelievable internet concept of hey, networking. Well, you can take anything and network it, and you know, you create something new, you create something a little bit um, more more functionality, and that's largely what we were doing. Right. It's uh, it's like the creation of JavaScript, for instance. Obviously, computer languages and scripting languages existed before, but taking it and applying it so they could run within the web browser and affect your HTML experience and and make the web dynamic, that was an innovation, right? But it's really just taking something you already know and glomming it together. It's the peanut butter and chocolate uh, analogy all over again, and and. Most of the time, I mean, certainly there are major innovations in, in the field. Most of the time, what we're doing in all product building processes is taking uh, parts and fitting them together and creating something more powerful because of the combination of those, of those parts. And as open source software, that's this thing that was really new in the, in the early 90s and late 80s, um, as that has blossomed, there's so many more components that you can just grab and take and use and a larger community to support all of those so that uh, application development has become more streamlined and faster and, and, and better in so many different ways because of that. Uh, so much of my job these days is just wiring things together to create this beautiful product made up of, of bigger and bigger Legos. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of what we were talking about before. And you were talking about just pushing stuff together. And I was just thinking about the way you describe links and that's basically you saw something that you could improve upon. You already knew how to do it. So you just, like you say, chocolate and the peanut butter. Sounds good to me. Yum. So, <laughs> I mean, you're obviously famous for developing the cookie, but I mean, you helped to put all the backend stuff, brought enjoyable browsers to people. Like you were saying before, it was text-based. Nobody's going to, unless they truly understand it, be able to navigate the internet. So you basically brought it to a front where non-technical users or people who are unfamiliar what Unix is or yeah, don't know how to use a mouse, basically. Exactly, exactly. It was such an amazing opportunity to be at Netscape because we, we were really foundationally creating this new infrastructure. And it was such a wide open space because the network is incredibly powerful. This idea of networking and pulling people together using the network is an incredible concept. And the feature set, the software for navigating the network was just incredibly primitive. So to be at that foundational spot and, and be a company that had good funding and we were able to hire other engineers to work on these interesting problems was just, it's, it's a really incredible place to find oneself. and. Uh, when you, if you find yourself in that environment, you can't really like. If you just go, you're gonna end up doing something really cool, I think. <laughs> and, and I just happened to be there. Uh, 
Um, really, you know, incredibly fortunate and happy that that happened. Um, and uh, I got to work on an in incredible number of super cool projects that created the, the technologies that we all that we all use today to create an, a really interactive web. When we started, the web was just static, flat content. You could read a document, but like if you could go see a Word doc or a or just a you know piece of paper. Uh, and when we finished, we had all of the tools to create a truly rich interactive uh, uh, programmatic environment. So you can make applications on the web. And of course, nowadays, everybody takes that for granted. You can do your banking online. You can do, uh, you can do amazing things. Um, you can create video content. And it's like, how was that even possible? Like, we, we weren't thinking about the you know, editing videos for sure. Uh, back in those days, but computers have become so much more powerful and the network has become so much uh, larger that all these things that would have been impossible to do back then are now entirely possible given the power and speed of, of modern computing and networks. Um, when when we were building this, I think the, the key to the, what has become the success of the web was we were thinking with a platform mindset. So instead of building a feature for a very specific purpose, we would always try to s step back and say, okay, here's a feature, but what is that a class of? What, what other features are similar to this? And how, how could we create uh, a, a platform feature here that would enable not just this, but a whole set of applications on top of it, a whole bunch of things. And so just making everything a little bit more general than it would necessarily need to be for a particular application um, enables all these parts to fit together in a way that allows people to build things that we had never imagined. Yeah. And I mean, just like you were saying, people take a, a granted, they just see the interface of the browser and they just assume it works fluidly, but they don't know what's backing it or how long it took to get there. It's just there. And, yeah. and then they get upset that it's not loading. Like I don't have the pictures here. But you could say the same thing in about a completely other field like astrophysics. Like, it, it's just funny how you don't understand the history that goes into something. So you take for granted like a web browser. Right. It's also a hedonic adaptation, right? You, and the first time you see something, it's amazing. <laughs> Next time, it's only okay. And then, uh, you, then you get used to it. And if it doesn't work, then you're pissed off. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> total total range of emotion. Uh, so you know, as technologists, we just got to keep delivering better and better all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, obviously, when you first developed the cookie, it was amazing because it was basically you could revisit a site and it would remember you. That's to the non-technical user. That's basically what you were getting from it, and you wouldn't have to have, as you coined, a amnesia browser. It wouldn't forget you every time you came back. It led to shopping carts down the line. It helped save information so you weren't constantly redoing stuff. Exactly, yeah. The the, the web prior to cookies uh, was uh, had no memory. The, the basic protocols um, just allow your browser to connect to a server and then disconnect as soon as it's gotten a single page. And then when it returns, it, so it'll reconnect to that server, it doesn't have any, any kind of session state there. So the the server that just previously had served you a document has no idea that you're the same browser that is asking for another document and another document. And that's fine if you're just asking for static pages, right? If, you, if all you needed to do was grab um, the Declaration of Independence from one spot and, um, and you know, some sort of uh, other document from another, you don't need to have memory. But if you're, if you're trying to build an application on your website that allows the user to make choices and interface and, and, and do interesting things, you absolutely need some way of recognizing that this is the same user that came and said, I'm interested in buying something and I would like to buy this. And then it would be great if when you went to the checkout, it actually knew what you wanted to buy and allowed you to check out. Um, so the cookie uh, was a solution to that. And it also the design uh, was attempting to be uh, as privacy protecting as possible given the technology. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some irony there. It didn't work out exactly the way we wanted to. It turned out that a couple of years later, we found out that cookies in combination with some other web technologies allowed for ad tracking. 
Um, and this is a good and bad thing. Uh, there, are, there are two sides to this coin. So um, cookies, again, were designed specifically to not allow for tracking. And so it was certainly in violation of the spirit of what cookies were designed for. Um, but as it turned out, that if you, if, if you can track an ad, i.e. know how many unique impressions there were, and if you know whether or not that person saw an ad and then went and bought something, it, it is a much better return for the advertisers. The advertisers were willing to spend money on websites that had ad tracking technologies, and it wasn't just a little bit more. It was a 10 to 100x improvement in, in, um, in, in revenue for advertisers, um, and just because you could measure the actual effect, and people really care about having you know, a dollar spent actually turning into some sort of value. Um, and so the, the cookie as an ad tracking mechanism, even though it wasn't designed to do that, gave the web some revenue source. And uh, you, you're probably familiar, most of the sites that we go to don't charge us any money. <laughs> so they rely on advertising for, this, uh, for, their, for their entire well-being. Um, and we haven't developed, unfortunately, any other, me any other great mechanisms, widespread mechanisms for funding websites that are not advertising driven. So there is this two-sided coin here, is that cookies have enabled advertisers and website content creators to make a revenue uh, for, uh, to continue making great content. On uh, the downside is that there has been some privacy loss from the, from the users using the web. Uh, when we when we found out that cookies could, could be used this way, we, we faced a really difficult decision. It mostly fell upon me because our company was in really difficult times. Then Microsoft was essentially trying to kill our company for years, and we were and they were mostly succeeding at that time. Uh, so the the things we were and 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 I was debating is to turn off third party cookies, which is the, really the mechanism that allows for tracking. Uh, or to you know keep them on and do nothing, which didn't feel right because it, again it violated the spirit of what cookies were designed to do, um, and it ended up coming up with an alternate option, which was to really make cookies visible, so that you could see when tracking was going on, and to give the user as much control as possible over their cookies, so that if they wanted to, they could clear them on a regular basis or have programmatic methodology for clearing them to turn off certain types of cookies or to not allow cookies on certain sites, that sort of thing. So you could specifically say, I don't want to allow cookies to go to an ad tracking network or something along those lines. And so this was the middle ground that allowed for advertisers to continue to still fund the web while giving the users uh, some control back. Uh, and that has worked out, I would say, pretty good. Um, not perfect. Obviously, there are still um, there are still valid concerns about privacy um, on on the web, um, and so it looks like cookies uh, will shortly third party cookies will probably be disabled for as an advertising mechanism in sometime in the in the near future. It's still unclear, but that looks like the direction things are going. Uh, but that could turn out to be bad for the user because the advertisers are not going away. They're just going to move to a different methodology that's less. Uh, well known, so you won't see cookies I indicted anymore in the advertising world, but something else will take over, and then you're likely to have less control over that uh, as it as it evolves. Do you think? I think I saw this maybe on your uh, AMA that you did on Reddit, but the revenue that got pumped into the internet after companies were finding out that cookies was such a good tool for finding customers and sales and stuff like that. What do you think the internet would look, or obviously this is another of our futuristic questions, more like a theoretical futuristic question, but what do you think the internet would have looked like if maybe cookies wasn't so predominantly in the nineties where the, all these comp, do you think it would have gone as far if all this money hadn't been pumped into it so early, where it was more slow and structured? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's, uh, like these questions of alternative history, that's another rich science fiction vein or maybe parallel universes well, in which every possible uh, if outcome... Mar if Marvel can do it, we can do it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So let's dive into the multiverse, shall we? Uh, so I think as somebody it's certainly been asked of me if I knew today uh, or if I knew about the third-party cookie vulnerability and specifically back when I designed cookies, 
um, what would I have done? And I'm pretty sure that it, in my 1994 head, given that the design was specifically to to avoid any kind of tracking, I would have um, implemented a, a, a <clears throat> secondary mechanism to make third-party cookies so they couldn't be used for a tracking mechanism. I've got a, several ideas about how I could do that technically, but that's not important. But let's say that I did know about that and I did that and third-party cookies were not able to be used for a tracking mechanism. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then that opens up kind of two other opportunities or two options for the historical timeline. One is that nobody is able to figure out a way of doing ad tracking at all, which actually I think is the least likely, right? Because um, there are many ways you can still do it today. Um, they involve JavaScript and they involve um, various network um, uh, details of the network. Um, certainly if people think they're anonymous when they are browsing from their home internet connectivity, even, you know, even in, in oct incognito mode, they're not entirely anonymous. Um, you need to take, you know, you need to go to like a Tor network or something you know, to get super anonymous. Um, but in general, tracking can be done with many other technologies. And so let's explore both of those. In the world where ad tracking never comes about, ads are far less valuable to the web. So there's a lot less, um, there's a lot less revenue coming in. And then it's possible that AOL wins. And so instead of being on the internet, you're on AOL now. And so, you know, you've got that, you I'm got still getting AOL guy. I'm still getting the disc too, right? <laughs> exactly. AOL 28. <laughs> Yeah, Steve Case could be the overlord of all networks, and uh, or you know maybe it's um, maybe it's the combination of AOL and and uh, Time, Time Warner, and uh, certainly Microsoft was a major player. That I would guess if in that world Microsoft eventually wins, because in at least in the commercial playbook they had this really good playbook. It might take them three times to get it right, but they just kept pumping money into it, and they had a decent engineering team. Eventually they got it right, and AOL was plodding along. So in that alternate history, Microsoft controls the network. Um, there, is no, there is no web browser, so there's no cross-platform application development environment, so there is no Macintosh, right? The, Mac, you know, the only reason that Mac was able to survive, well, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that it, uh, you could have applications written the, in, on the internet, and so most of what we do today, you don't need to have custom apps written for your Mac and your and your PC. Now, obviously, it looks funny be, to you know newer users because Apple looks like this giant company. But um, Apple was just about out of business, and Sun Microsystem almost bought them <laughs> uh, for like a pennies on the dollar, and it, they were pretty much also ran. It, they one of the reasons they're still around is Microsoft invested like a billion dollars into them to keep them alive, so they didn't face antitrust uh, allegations. So. You know, this whole alternate history thing is, is super fun. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like the idea of, uh, you know, an alternate history of some of the world wars and waking up where the other side wins. So uh, imagining Microsoft as controlling all of our networking and computing is incredibly scary to me. So that, that's the, like, the darkest scenario I could come up with. Uh, the all other ones is that, micro that advertising finds some other way of, of working out tracking and it's a, it's a silent tracking mechanism. And so cookies never come up. You don't have this like nice clever name that you can put on it. Um, and it's potentially like the, the advantage of cookies as a tra ad tracking mechanism is it really requires a lot of websites to, uh, to conspire together with a single advertiser to make it work. So it's really obvious and easy to tell when an advertising network is in effect. And those companies are, are necessarily large and you know, in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And so we can clearly see who the network, who the advertisers are. Um, most of them are public companies and they, are, they have a really strong vested interest in not doing really bad things with our data. Now, mm -hmm. certainly there have been, there have been problems, um, but I would also I would also clarify that most of the, pri the, the, the serious data breaches that we've had have been private network breaches on first party systems, meaning company uh, that um, might have the initials FB 
who ha collects a lot of data about users coming to their site, has nothing to do with an advertising network, and that data leaks out to, uh, to either because they sell that data or because a hacker comes in and steals that data. Um, it's pretty rare that somebody comes in and tries to steal a bunch of ad tracking data because the reality is it's incredibly boring. What it said, the ad tracking data says, this browser has, has visited some site and it's interested in camping tents and we're gonna serve them a bunch of, uh, a bunch of camping advertisements. Uh, but it has no n real knowledge of a user's name or their credit card numbers or anything like that. Uh, when you become a member of a, of a, a website that, you know, where you might put your whole life into, like all of your social network posts and, and your birth date and everything, when that data leaks out, that's a significant problem. The, those sites are holding you know, really interesting, personally identifiable information. Um, and that's why good technology companies work really, really hard to isolate uh, PII uh, and credit card numbers and those sorts of things or encrypt them and, and, and work really hard to try to prevent those kinds of leaks. Yeah, when we look back at it, it seems so simple, but it's just expanded just from sheer growth of, I guess, I mean, money's driving everything. That's that's the end end result of it. Money is a necessary evil, but it also you know gets us a lot of things that are desirable, right? It's a it's a uh, it's a neutral form of of payment that can be for very good or very evil. I mean, that's that's true of the technology I've made and true of everybody's technology is we invent something and we we're no matter our intentions it, it's its use is out of our hands once we've set it free and sometimes it's used for incredible good and sometimes it's used for bad and sometimes incredible bad so i i think that uh my inventions have been on, on the whole very positive uh although you know we haven't gotten out of the 21st century yet so <laughs> we still have to see you know, if we as a as a as a society, we can kind of cope with all the new challenges around being incredibly networked and, in, and it have have this you know massive feed of information hitting us at, from all angles at uh, at incredible speed. Uh, it's certainly creating a tremendous number of challenges sociologically uh, and uh, societally and polit politically and in in all areas of our of our culture. Um, things are happening really rapidly and not all of it looks good. Yeah. So speaking in the future, there's one question I'd like to ask people more of a job interview question, but where do you see yourself in five years still uh, working where you are currently? I would like to. Uh, so yeah, my company right now is Jet Insight. Uh, we are making a software and technology to make uh, the um, the charter aircraft world a lot more efficient. So uh, it's a network of tens of thousands of planes that um, you can contract to fly wherever you want. And there's a lot of inefficiency in the business because there's a lot of um, independent operators who don't intercommunicate. So we're trying to make software to essentially network them together and, and help make the whole industry more efficient and lower costs and hopefully create a, a new revolution in, in uh, personal transport and um, aircraft uh, aircraft that'll take you actually where you want to go and not just to the big cities. Have you guys, I, I don't know how far out this is future-wise since we're talking so much future, but unmanned aircrafts, has that ever talked about? Um, yes, uh, yes and no. So uh, we're fairly agnostic as to the plane. Uh, what we're trying to create is um, the technology around the scheduling and the bringing, infrastructure, bringing customers and that sort of thing. And it's fairly plain agnostic. So if somebody comes up with a better plane tomorrow, that's really good for our business. Um, uh, you know, it, these idea of using like personal drone technology to carry us as air taxis, those sorts of things that are all really interesting, uh, technological advancements. Um, I think you might be getting at, um, self-driving planes maybe, uh, or, yeah. or yeah. So we've had the technology for a really long time to have self-driving planes. And the reality is, is pilots don't want it. And the public doesn't seem to want it either. They, they would much rather have what they perceive as a, as a super competent um, man in charge or man or woman in charge in, in front taking care of business. Because you know, we love our computers, but it, it, somewhere deep inside, none of us fully trust, <laughs> trust it or want to live with it. But you know, many, many airplanes have automated landing systems and automated takeoff systems. And for the most part, a pilot is 
really in command, but they they can. They and I'm not saying they do, uh, but they could uh, largely fly the airplane simply by punching in a bunch of instructions and and supervising the plane as it's in flight. Uh, not all planes have that level of automation either, but it's certainly possible to to do that because flying is way easier than driving in a city. Right? It's, it's, you don't have things around you. The airports are well located and they they have people on the ground there who are able to make sure that the runway is clear. None of those are true in a self-driving car. And so the, the technology there is is incredibly more complex to create self-driving uh, ground vehicles. So one question I'd like to close with, uh, what is something that your parents did that you pass on to your children and what's something that you try to avoid um, that your parents did that you don't want to pass on to your children? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that a lot. Uh, something comes to mind. So, um, the, the little humor here too, because uh, in, in uh, yeah, I think I'm Gen X. I'm not sure what generation I actually am, but um, there's some people talk about the us as being like the latchkey generation or the you know the the one the unsupervised. Um, and I wouldn't say that's entirely true. Uh, my my mom was a stay-at-home mom. We had she had four kids, so very busy, and um, and we had some challenges, um, uh, especially when I was in high school. My my brother was uh, is severely injured, uh, but she took care of business. And mostly, my parents tried. I think what they were doing is setting a good example and allowing us to kind of figure stuff out for ourselves. Um, that, and it, I think it created within me a lot of independence and, and, and necessarily built up a lot of skills that I might not have gotten if I was just catered to as a, as a lot of parents might do today, uh, or protected. Uh, and so I've tried to be as similar as possible with my kids. Um, it's a different world today. You can't let you, you can't leave your eight, eight, eight year old at home while you go out to dinner. <laughs> I don't know if my parents did that. I'm not, I'm not saying they did, but you know, that was certainly a common thing to do. In the eighties is like, oh, they'll be fine. <laughs> we'll just go, we'll just go. Uh, and we'll drunk drive home too. Uh, but, uh, definitely, definitely don't drive, drive drunk. Um, but, uh, try to, you know, I, I think my mission as a parent is to, get my kids out the door like that's my goal is not to like protect them or the other things my whole purpose is to give them the skills they need to be successful independent adults and be able to leave the nest on their own when they're of sufficient age uh, and so try to um, try to let them be them give them the opportunity to make mistakes because you learn a lot more i certainly don't want them to make any life shattering mistakes i uh, want to avoid those so as I teach them to drive, that's, there's a lot of cautiousness there, but if they, you know, want to go and hang out with their friends at the park, I'm not like, oh, don't do this and don't do that and don't get involved in any of this. Like, they'll figure it out, right? It's very unlikely to get into such crazy, uh, you know, craziness that it shatters their life. Yeah, makes sense. That's it, sir. Nice. Did I, did I answer every question that you, you wanted? You did amazingly. You gave such good perspective to the cold, hard facts, the details, and that's good, especially with coding. It's hard to, uh, just as you know, try to put something behind that besides zeros and ones and loops. And yeah, I, we did I do a lot say, of if thens, though. <laughs> there are a lot of if thens. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would, I would say to anyone listening, if they are interested in in coding, that it's it don't just take a programming course and and you know, make up your mind there you really have to build something like the beauty to me is it's it's a framework for building something and it, i one thing i know about myself is i just love building things i don't care about the language i'm using i don't care whether it's it's you know two by fours or if then statements i really like building things and that's shared by a lot of people, but many of the courses um, are teaching the language and the syntax, and they don't get it, give you enough opportunity to creatively build something because that's where the magic really happens. Uh, that's that's it's really everything to me. It's just this beauty this beauty of being able to create something from nothing. It's it's a bit like art, like you you don't know what you're going to end up with necessarily, 
and when it works and it makes other people's uh, life better or makes them smile or whatever your purpose of your what you're building even if it just makes you smile uh, it's a, it's a beautiful thing and uh, I, I it's also a, a, a wonderful career uh, obviously uh, I'm, I'm a musician as well I'm not a great musician but I, I would in another alternate history is like if I had tried to make it as a musician uh, trying to think about how much more difficult my life would be I, as a average programmer I'm able to be very successful because uh, I just just keep applying myself and, and, and keep working hard uh, as an average musician you make no money <laughs> just about <laughs> and then you struggle for your whole life just to just to uh, you know put food on the table and it's so difficult um, and I have so much respect for people who go through that journey uh, and they're incredible like the folks who make it out the other side are just incredible dedication and talent and uh, that that's that's like the other side of it like if you can find something you love that also is a a job that doesn't suck back to the theme of <laughs> finding a job that doesn't suck that's a it's a good place to be and then i play music for fun on the weekends <laughs> there you go no i've always pitched that idea that i mean coding should be maybe middle school, high school, something that's taught because you can apply it to any field. You can reduce down what you're doing. But like you say, if you build it, build it something that you love or you're interested in. Like if you love plants, categorize your plants, make a program for, you know what I mean? You could do anything with it. Just put a flavor on it, something you love. Exactly. And just take any tool. I mean, even a spreadsheet is programming. It's, it, we're not picky. Like the, the world is changing really quickly and technology is, as I mentioned, getting into bigger and bigger Legos. You, you don't have to be a hardcore assembly programmer to make a difference these days. You can find so many different ways of pulling together code blocks and, and other things to create uh, innovative solutions that, again, brings value, makes people smile, it makes their life easier. Anything you could do there is valuable, uh, both from a, it's cool to build something and also from an economic value point of view. Yeah. That's it, sir. Thank you very much. You, You're very this welcome. Was, this was amazing. Thank you for the opportunity. I was, it was a great experience. <laughs> I still think you might be more interesting than me. <laughs> you got a great podcast. I, I'm, I'm very jealous about that. If you like this week's episode of People More Interesting Than Me, please follow me on Apple Podcasts so you won't miss out on more episodes like these.